Oh, hey Jared. Uh, what's up? Uh, not much. Just felt like uh, talking. You? Uh, no, nothing much. Nothing much. Uh, hey, how's that uh, video? Uh, Prey? Yeah, how's that Prey video coming along? Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, pretty good. I was just uh, thinking of recording some VO uh, today. Yeah, you said you were working on a particular level, right? Uh, which one was that again? Uh, Shuttle Bay. Wait, what? Wait, which one's Shuttle Bay again? Sh shuttle Bay? You know, the one with the, the shuttle in the middle of it. You need to open it up and, like, dolls, so, like, security is there, and it's like... Oh! Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I got you, I got you. <laughs> Um, sorry, I, it, it, to be honest, I, like, I kind of forgot about that one. You, you forgot about it? Well, yeah, I mean, apart from the fact that it's got that old-fashioned space shuttle in the middle of it, it's, um, it's not really much else, it's kind of, it's a bit dull. Dull? Well, I mean, you know, praise thing is about, you know, it's about stealth, and it's about having a lot of verticality to play with, and just, that's like a big open area where you can't really get on the roof it's you got can't tons really... of vertical it's got the, the the command thing on the side you know it's got like oh. offices and i don't know if i was you and i was doing that video i i, I don't know i'd look at one of the best I'd, I'd look at a different level. I, I you know i'd look at hardware labs oh, and that's a cool level oh excuse me you, you're gonna tell me how to like what i should focus on that's just well i i know you i i know that i'm talking to uh mr Hashtag level designer here, but I'm just saying, in regards to, you know, Prey, there's... I, I don't know, Shuttle Bay's a bit of a weird one. That's all I'm saying. Dude, you target shit. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm just I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I mean, the point of the video is that you're going to tell me why it's good, right? Y you know what? Yeah. You know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to go work on that, you know? Oh, well, I mean, I was just trying to, you know, I was just trying to you know, kind of challenge the idea a little bit and... So, in the last video, we talked about the systems of Prey, identifying some of the problems therein, and then focused on how the first level sets the player up into habits not conducive with having the most fun with the game. This kinda sucks, because some of the people working on this game have been in the industry for decades on teams making some of the best immersive sims to have ever been produced. Because of this, Prey does a very good job of recreating, and even furthering, the system-driven gameplay that defines the genre, which means that a poor introduction prevents a lot of new players from experiencing what makes this lineage of games so great. It wasn't at the Shuttle Bay level where I started connecting with Prey, but by the time I reached there I had started to parse the potential Gordian knot of interactions the game had to offer. So, as promised last time, we'll go through this level for a better example of Prey's potential, documenting a playthrough that engages with more of the available systems, which looks something like this. I say something like this, because immersive sims are built around each player having very distinct experiences from one another. Experiences between playthroughs, even, are radically different. Because I went for hacking and mostly avoided psi powers in my first run-through, on the second campaign I wanted to focus on psi powers and avoid hacking altogether. Because of this, the playthrough I recorded is going to be focused primarily around this playstyle, so let's just briefly go over what upgrades I had. Physician 1 to make medkits a bit more effective. Psionic Aptitude 3 to max my Psy Pool to 250 points. Neurostimulant 2 to make Psy Hypos twice as effective. Psychotronics 1 to give me two more scope chipset slots. Leverage 3 so I can move any object in the environment. Repair 1 to fix some basic things. Gunsmith 1 to allow for some better weapon upgrades. Suit Modification 1 for a bit more inventory space. Conditioning for increased health and stamina, Mobility 1 to move a bit faster, and Combat Focus 1, which was a fucking waste, because half the time when Psy Powers are used, time slows down when selecting a target anyways. For Psy Powers, I had Kinetic Blast 1, which is a pretty basic attack that knocks things around, Psychoshock 2, which damages enemies and disables their Psy Powers for a few seconds, Remote Manipulation 1, which allows the player to grab objects from afar, and Machine Mind 2, which makes robotic enemies allied with the player for a minute or so. 
It's also pretty handy, by the way, because if the player purchases four or more Psy upgrades, turrets will start thinking they're a Typhon and start shooting at them, so having a way to instantly stop them is a huge advantage. So, up to this point, the player's been searching for two arming keys to potentially destroy Talos 1. One was Morgan's, or theirs, but was destroyed, so they need to find the fabricator plan to make another one. After re-entering the station through the cargo bay, where they help out some survivors fight off some Typhon, the player eventually arrives back at the Arboretum to enter Alex's office, as he as the other arming key. After begrudgingly letting Morgan into his office, Alex says he'll give up his key if the player does some quick research for him. Midway through uploading the results, though, the transmission gets interrupted, and Walter Dahl appears. Dahl is a mercenary hired by Transtar's board of directors to take control of the ship. Hijacking the station speakers, he announces Transtar employees should surrender in order to be evacuated, but that Morgan and Alex are relieved of their duties. At that point, a number of hostile operators, presumably hacked by Dahl, come crashing through the windows of the office. These are also military operators, which the player hasn't seen before, so encountering a new enemy type with a new behavior, shooting lasers, only compounds the shock. Alex informs the player that their research won't finish uploading until Dahl is taken care of, and prompts the player to go to the shuttle bay, which is where all arrivals and departures to Talos 1 go through. Shortly after that, though, January contacts the player, reminding them that all Transtar employees have tracking bracelets, including them, which Dahl could use to anticipate Morgan coming after them. Because of this, January tells the player they can go to deep storage and deactivate their bracelet, making confronting Dahl easier. This is optional, but it changes a couple of things in the area's approaching shuttle bay, which we'll cover later. One last thing is that Dahl's military operators aren't coming from out of thin air. Well, okay, they kind of are, but the point is they're coming from operator dispensers, some of which the player's been able to use prior, and others that have been lying dormant up until this point, which is another awesome way the Systems of Prey made me reinterpret the game's world. The dispensers will keep making military operators until a certain number are roaming the environment, and then stop. This is smart, not just because endlessly spawning AI would start causing performance issues, but because the player can use this rule to their advantage. For instance, if they have Hacking 4, which I did in my first playthrough, the player can hack the operators to be allied with them. Because this doesn't destroy or remove an operator from the game, this means the dispenser won't create another operator to take its place, effectively nullifying an enemy. Destroying an operator, however, will prompt the creation of another, so if the player's set on bashing in every robot they come across, they'll have to keep moving, lest they get cornered by an endless stream of foes. Once they're ready to go into Shuttle Bay, the player has a couple of different ways they can enter. The sneaky way would be via the Gravitational Utility Tunnel System, or GUTS for short, explaining that pun I made in Part 1, uh, leading the player to enter via the ground floor. The more conventional way to enter, though, is via the lobby, down past where that turret got introduced. The player will need the general access keycard to get in here, but that's obtained really early in the game, so it's a non-issue. Entering through the bulkhead that activates the level transition, look at this fucking gorgeous initial read! Because the player starts in this entry room, the columns and lower ceiling form a frame through which the lobby here is viewed. Given that, fictionally, this area is where people arrive and enter the main area, a wide hallway-like space leads from the door from the lobby straight to where the shuttle docks, the carpet communicating the intended path. On either side are rooms that the player will find out are a lounge and an office, so their walls, along with the floor and the ceiling, form the borders of another frame, encircling the shuttle itself. The entry room the player's in is all shadowy, contrasting with this light in the lobby coming from overhead. The walls of the office and lounge facing the player are easy to make out, both because of this light and because their color contrasts pretty well with the jade green of these columns. The shuttle itself has a light shining on its front, making it stand out against the blackness of outer space. All of this combines to communicate that there's space to the left and right of the player as they walk out of this room, and that the objective is right there in front of them. It's pretty blunt, actually, but there's no better way to direct your players than saying, Welcome to the shuttle bay! Here it is. And you don't need to use anything else to communicate this that could prove potentially distracting. In the distance, the player sees a phantom dash and try to engage with a couple of robots getting killed in the process. 
Seeing this in front of the shuttle is enough to push most players to the sides, but even if they are foolhardy to plow right through to face a couple of turrets and military operators, the player quickly sees that there's no way directly onto the shuttle itself. You know, the player could glide down onto the shuttle if they got up somewhere high enough. How about that uh, control tower looking thing up there? Doubling back, the player looks around and sees signs pointing to a door saying employee entrance, but it's locked and needs a keycard. Past that area are the bathrooms, which the player can rummage some supplies from. But how do we get past this door? Well, there's this ceiling fixture that's a bunch of parallel pieces of metal, but some of it at the end is bent, causing it to really stick out. Hopefully the player picks up on this and climbs up the barricade, from which they can jump onto it. From here, the player can climb into a vent area above where the employee entrance door is. Oh hey look, a Neuromod. To the right of that is a hatch leading out to another duct, opening down to the hall on the other side of the door, and from here the player can unlock it. Right by that door, the player sees another locked door leading into that office along the one end of that path to the shuttle. The player sees a grav shaft deactivated. However, there's a sticky note on it placed by someone who said they shut the shafts down, but that they can be reactivated by reaching a terminal on the floor below in the tooling room. Oh, um, also if the player didn't drop down from that duct, they could have just uh, used it to climb through a hatch on the other side and use a terminal there to power up the grav shafts and skip the next chunk of this level. Uh, whoops. Turning around, the player sees an exit to the left, leading down onto some scaffolding that leads out to the more open docking area. There's a balcony here with some siding blocking them from view, which is fortunate because of the turret on the area below facing towards them, and the several military operators that are sure to be ambling around. Turning right, then left, is the staircase leading down to that plateau, and a jet of flame is visible below, communicating the presence of those flammable pipes. Here I used Machine Mind on the military operator to set it against the turret position below, uh, before realizing that the turret was about to outlast it. To circumvent it, the player can jump over the railing to the platform below, shielded by some Univac-style computer terminals. From here, the player can sneak behind the turret and slip down to the next platform area, or just jump down again to the ground floor below. Assuming they go down the stairs though, a pillar can be seen jutting out of the room below. Looking around it, the player sees another turret, making apparent that the duct is there to block the sight line. There are some stairs to the left of where the player entered, but further to the left of that is a console providing cover, and the computer terminal of a Frank Jones, which requires hacking too to open. Further along this direction is a toolbox the player can loot, another console area, and some stairs going down towards the airlock. Going back and down the flight of stairs in front of that last turret leads the player into this weird enclosed workshop area. Uh, mind your head. Uh, this enclosed area forms a ring around where the stairs end, with an additional nook in front and to the left that's quite conspicuously lit. There's a toolbox to the right that the player can scrounge through, on the shelves below the stairwell are some glue canisters, and there's some crafting material on the drill presses to the left. Going to the nook though, the player finds a shuttle control room keycard on the corpse of Scott Parker, with which the player can open that door by the grav shafts. If they go into that office, they'll find another neuromod, some shotgun shells, and a weapon upgrade kit. Going back up a bit and jumping over the side, the player ends up by the room where Guts leads to. Around the corner to the workshop though, the player can see into their goal, the tooling room, blocked by a combination of blinds and furniture. A greater mimic is hanging out inside, and a voltaic phantom can be seen patrolling the hall, if the player wants to take out either preemptively. Further along is the door to this set of rooms, which requires the shuttle control room keycard we just picked up to be opened. Unlocking it and taking care of enemies, the short hall branches off into three rooms. A gross looking bathroom to the right, a material storage room straight ahead, where a fabricator can be found, and the tooling room to the left. After looting a couple of toolboxes and a corpse, the player makes their way around the desk in this room towards the computer terminal in the back. From here, the player can reactivate the grav shafts and make their way up to the third floor. There's some other interesting areas on this floor though. First, going down the stairs off the far end on top of the workshop, the airlock mentioned earlier is fully visible. Slightly to the left though are another set of grav shafts. The player can actually get to these if they go left at the balcony next to the shuttle. Behind these as well is the recycler placed in the level, as well as a door that can be opened to get to the tooling room door from the opposite end. 
beneath those platforms connected to the top of the workshop are some vats, presumably for rocket fuel or something similar, that the player can weave through on the ground floor. Next to there are a couple of shipping containers, though only one is open and the other doesn't seem openable. From here, the player can jump into this pit near the hatch where the shuttles actually enter and exit, though there's some canisters giving off radioactivity at the bottom, and there's not much of anything going on here. A stairwell on the other end lets the player climb out near the airlock. Back at the grav shafts by the office, the player takes them up to the third floor, the control tower right in front of them. Off to the right is the balcony leading there, with an operator dispenser located there, and more than likely a couple of operators floating around. To the left, however, is the office of one Mia Bayer. Going in, the player encounters two mimics hiding. Mia's computer and a safe are accessible here, but only for players with at least hacking three. Next to the computer are a Psy Hypo and a chipset, and on the shelves closer to the door is a medkit. Going back out, the player can deal with the operators there as they see fit, though I just used Machine Mind again to get them fighting. The walkway to the control tower door, however, is torn in two. Fortunately, the player can hop up on the bent railing and glide over, hopefully getting a drop on the other military operator that's in the room. On the desk to the left are a few shotgun shells, and on the far end of the room are another weapon upgrade kit and Neuromod. The corpse of Mia Bayer is also here, next to the shotgun she holed up with, apparently. Going down towards the windows, the player can smash the glass here, but there's a computer terminal catching the player's eye. Oh hey, a couple of buttons here allow the player to extend the walkway to the shuttle. Unlocking a destination is a fine enough goal as is, but getting such an explicit visual indication of doing so is just awesome. From here, the player can glide down onto the shuttle as intended, or walk down normally if they're fucking boring. Hitting the panel on the shuttle's side, the player enters. To the left is a cargo area with a locked door on the far end. Turning around towards the cockpit, another Neuromod is waiting for them on one of the desks there. Moving towards the front, the player sees a terminal they can use to obtain a file. Turns out it's an audio log of Dahl being given permission to kill everyone on Talos 1 by... Morgan's father, William. William Yu also informs Dahl where he can place his personal operator on the ship, the one that's been hacking the systems allowing Dahl to spawn military operators and hijack the speaker system. It's random every time, but this playthrough it happened to be in Hardware Labs, where the first mission after the player first enters Morgan's office takes place. With this knowledge, the player heads out and exits Shuttle Bay any way they see fit. Except, as the player loads into another map, Dahl contacts them and informs them that he's cut off oxygen to the cargo bay, where the player helped all those crew members fight off some Typhon. As the leader of that group, Sarah Elazar, contacts the player, a timer starts, only giving the player 15 minutes to rectify the situation. Elazar informs the player that the controls are in life support. The most direct path to life support is for the player to go back into the lobby and take the central elevator down to that department of the station, which is what I did. I, um, may have spent a little time procrastinating. Given that the players already had to pass through here, they'll be at least somewhat familiar with the layout. Running down the hall leads to a stairwell going down into this central area, with the door to the atmosphere control rooms on the right. Unsurprisingly, there's more military operators here the player's going to have to deal with in a hurry. This area forms a torus around this array of fans in the middle, with two rooms overlooking it on either side. Dahl's in the one to the right of the door where the player enters, though he's locked himself in. Because of that, the player's going to have to go up to the left to the air filtration control room. Turning right after the stairs, the player uses the glue gun to take care of these flame jets in front of the door. Going past the consoles in the middle of the room, the player accesses a terminal right in front of their view of Dahl, and attempts to use it to decontaminate the air. Unfortunately, a warning pops up saying that Fan 3 is malfunctioning, preventing the decontamination from happening. Running out of the room and to the right, the player heads to the back of the area, turning right to get to the fan control terminal. Quickly running the diagnostics program reveals that Fan 3 is jammed, which, um... Uh, oh. Well, uh... Sure is. Jumping over the balcony, the player quickly pulls the pipe out from the fan. Climbing back up to the terminal, the player can confirm that all fans are operational again, then run back to the air filtration room and run that utility again. Because of this, the air in the area is sucked out, causing the helmet of Morgan's spacesuit to deploy. 
doll, who doesn't have a suit, is incapacitated, but airflow to the cargo bay still needs to be restored. Around back, the player can open the door if they have Hacking 4, but since most people won't, they'll need to find another way in. There's a window above these stairs where the player can remove a cabinet if they have Leverage 2 and... C come on! <laughs> come on, let me in! Is there another way around here to get in? It... Ah, fuck. I, um, may have spent a little time procrastinating. Before wrapping up, there's a side quest that takes place in Shuttle Bay that I'd like to cover. To the left of the entry from the lobby is a hall leading down to the Escape Pod Bay. It's blocked by a tape drive that requires Leverage 3 to move, though the player can also go down the hall from the grav shafts by the airlock. Going past a turret and down the flight of stairs, the player is contacted by Frank Jones, who informs them he's in an escape pod with a co-worker, Emanuela. Unfortunately, the pod jammed when they tried to escape, so they need help getting out. Jones instructs the player to go outside and uncouple the door manually, then come back inside and use the force eject option on the terminal to jettison them out. Jones warns them, however, that using the force eject without opening the door outside will cause the pod to explode where it is. Going through this quest is pretty simple. Just go back up to the airlock and out the station, fly over to the left, and hit a few red explosive caps while taking care of some cystoid nests. The player then just needs to come back to the pod bay and hit a button on the terminal by the window to complete it. Emanuela then contacts the player to give them the location of a reward, and thanks them for helping them escape, despite Frank. Uh, uh this, was there something about him I need to know? The location of this reward is in the bathroom across from the tooling room where the player reactivated the grav shafts. Climbing up and into the drop ceiling, which turned out to be really janky, the player opens a briefcase that has two neural mods and a note implying that they were meant for Emanuela's mother. Oh right, Frank Jones's terminal was above the workshop. I should go back here in my other playthrough so I can hack it open. And it's still unclear what he actually did. Seriously, does anyone know? I seem to have completely missed it. Oh, and that quest to disable the tracking bracelet. The idea is that Dahl can manipulate certain systems he's hacked into, being able to thwart the player as they traverse the station. From the point where the player gets the quest to enter the shuttle bay, in the Arboretum, there's two main pathways there, through the lobby of Talos 1, and through Guts. If the player does not disable their tracking bracelet and goes through Guts, Dahl contacts them and says he can see them coming. What he does, though, is turn the gravity back on in the tunnels, then turns it on and off again repeatedly. Aside from a one-off towards the end of the game where gravity gets disabled across the whole space station, I didn't think changing the gravity of an area was something the game was capable of doing at runtime. This event is just awesome, making a drastic change that both shows the power Dahl has over Talos 1's structure and makes this area even more hazardous and disorienting. So how does Dahl tracking the player impact entering through the lobby? Well, the player goes down there and, uh... Uh, seems like a normal group of enemies here. Uh, well, maybe it changes the environment in Shuttle Bay, so let's just go in and, and check real quick, and, um... Uh, uh, that can't be right. I, no, no enemies knowing where I am? No, no changes in the obstacles? I mean, <laughs> come on. There's gotta be, like... Uh, Hey, Jared! What's oh, up? fuck yourself. All right, all right, James is right. There are some areas where Shuttle Bay is lacking, especially in approaching it. This contrast between this awesome idea in Guts and nothing is pretty enervating. Whenever I criticize someone else's work, I want to put special emphasis on me not being on that team. I don't know the state the game was in a month before launch, and ultimately there's only so many person hours that can be put into the game before you have to ship it. Because of this ambiguity, maybe implementing a special case for Guts and not one for the lobby or going into Shuttle Bay was the most the team could devote to this quest before moving on to more critical shortcomings that needed attention. For all I know, in that situation, the decisions made that resulted in this end product are the exact same that I would have made, and in all likelihood, they were probably smarter than anything I could have come up with. But, when January first notified me that Dahl will be able to see you coming, 
my expectations of what that would involve weren't exactly astronomical. My first thought would be that I'd enter the level and all the enemies would be alerted to my location or something similar, though as I first approached the entrance via the lobby, it occurred to me that a blockade in front of the entrance would have been possible, especially with how the hall narrows in order to funnel the player into there. Again, I know there's a finite amount of time you can work on a piece of art before it needs to get out the door, but I don't think setting up a blockade or an event that alerts a bunch of AI in a level is that labor-intensive. Again, maybe I'm missing some piece of info about how the development of Prey progressed, but if there was a way to shave off a couple of hours somewhere else, I think devoting time to something that falls along the game's critical path would have taken priority. One last thing about Shuttle Bay I'll critique are the areas that are just kinda empty, especially on the far side of the map across from the shuttle. Take for example this area just past the airlock. All it really does is serve as a way to get down to this large divot, presumably where the shuttle actually moves into the station. And that might be okay if the area it led to had something interesting to do there, but all that's really there are a couple of radioactive barrels and maybe a mimic. This area just ends up feeling like an empty swimming pool, which is not terribly fun because I don't think you can even do a kickflip in this game. Similarly, the area on the other side of the entry has some interesting obstacles, with a couple of shipping containers being present, and some large tanks to weave in and out of. But there's no enemy presence, and any items I got there were redundant and uninteresting. This and the other areas might be more engaging if I had been chased around by replenishing military operators and I was stumbling through to evade them. But since the playstyles I went for focused on pacifying operators through hacking or psi powers, that left little of anything fun to do in this chunk of the map. What I like about Shuttle Bay is how focused it is. Aside from the appendicular escape pod bay, the whole of the level is molded around the area where the shuttle is docked. Not only is the spacecraft placed there prominently as a goal for the player to see on entry, but because of the way the rooms form an orbit around it, the shuttle can be seen from most areas. When the player completes an objective anywhere in the map, they're not going to think, ah geez, how do I get back to the rocket, because, you know, it's right there. And when the player actually gets to open the rocket, it's just such a cool moment. Because of the position of the button controlling the walkway, the player's likely to see it moving, giving feedback about what they just did and direction on where to go next. I'm also just a fan of letting the player do anything to move elements of the environment around to change the layout. It's just so toyetic and fun while letting the player feel like they have an impact on the game. Lastly, this scaffolding on the ground floor is kind of weird, but in a neat way. Looking at the structure, it communicates more overtly this particular intended path for the player to get from the grav shaft room to the center of the bay area. Specific wider areas are present that serve as an engagement plateau, with thinner connections running between them. Maybe it feels a bit artificial and gamey, but it's alleviated by the fact that the player can just jump over the railing at any point, still allowing for the player to carve their own route. All this kind of shows that Shuttle Bay is a land of contrast, thank you. It's a good level, for sure, but when placed in the context of a game that's more than good, parts of it feel underwhelming. So what makes other levels in Prey more solid in comparison, and how could that be applied to making Shuttle Bay more solid? Something I've only indirectly mentioned is the way all of the maps in Prey fit together. Instead of being a linear set of levels which each never to be returned to again on completion, Prey is organized into an open world. Well, kind of. Each level in the game is still very separate, needing to be entered or exited at very specific points and requiring sitting through a loading screen. But a lot of emphasis was put on how they ostensibly fit together spatially. The player is given both a local map that fills in as they move around the area, as well as a station map that shows where each branch of Talos 1 is in relation to all the others. But the game also provides more immediately apparent examples to communicate this spatial relationship. This, uh, this spaceship, it, it, uh, no, just, no, not at all. When we talked about the intro level, one of the first things the player sees when entering the lobby is an explosion somewhere else on the ship. As it turns out, that's Hardware Labs, where the next mission takes place. When introduced to going outside the station for a spacewalk, that breach is specifically where the player's meant to retrieve a keycard, really cementing that this is a place. 
This is also reinforced with a number of windows the player can look outside at. If the player goes outside, they'll see the same enemies and items hanging around that location that they saw from the inside. And what's really nuts is that this extends to things the player's done. For instance, if the player returns to an area they previously had a fight in, the remains of enemies will still be there. Particular machines or panes of glass the player's broken will stay broken, and the game even saves the position of glue clumps. What's amazing is that this isn't even new. System Shock 2 actually had something like this, though it actually accomplished this by saving a copy of every map with player changes, which, you know, I guess is one way to do it. You know, I keep bringing up System Shock 2 in this video. This has a couple of implications. First, more simply, it prevents the crafting system from being abused. Because a plant object saves whether or not the player harvested flowers from it to get organic material, the player can't just run back and forth between maps to farm more flowers. And B, more importantly, it communicates this intent from the designers that the player is not only able to revisit locations, but is expected and sometimes required to. So, levels have to be designed so that they can be played through multiple times from multiple starting points. This seems like a good place to start, but how do you actually do that in practice? Well, looking at Shuttle Bay, the entrances and exits to it are the door to the lobby on the second floor, and the airlock to the outside, and the door to Guts, which are on opposite ends of the ground floor. Because of this, we can start by drawing a direct line between them in space, calling those our main paths. From here, the layout of the level can be constructed around them, contorting and twisting the main paths as needed. Because of this, there's multiple paths through the area, which all have ways of connecting by breaking off the main routes. For instance, if in the shuttle bay the player wanted to get to the airlock, they could go forward where the turrets are stationed, then take a left and go down the grav shafts and head over to the airlock. Or they could go left immediately and remove a blockade if they have leverage 3, then go right and end up at the same grav shafts. Or they could go the way I did in the walkthrough and go across the scaffolding to the airlock, or they could just go forward and use the jetpack to jump over the railing, and there's a dozen other ways I could list as well. You'll notice that these primary paths are pretty well telegraphed as well. The red carpet extends from the entry to the lobby to the shuttle dock, with a walkway extending to the left towards the grav shafts, and on the ground floor, a pretty wide and clear path extends to the airlock. From the lobby entry to Guts, Going through the office area actually takes the player down this scaffolding, with the walkway pretty explicitly communicating the intended path. Finally, from guts to the airlock are these paths on the ground floor wrapping around the workshop, sort of like small canyons, ushering the player between those locations. So first, make some primary paths between the entry points to your level, and have other elements in the environment support those paths if possible. Second, keep the layout around these paths a bit open, so that the player has opportunities to bushwhack between the main paths, and to prevent traversal through the area from getting boring. These are supposed to be reusable. If you're familiar with the game though, you may notice some areas that could prove to be exceptions. The tutorial level takes place in the Neuromod division, with almost every door being blocked off or locked, constraining the player to a pretty linear area. The level as a whole, though, connects to the rest of Talos 1 only via the entrance to the lobby, meaning there's only one entrance and no other exits to draw a path between. The level itself opens up around the lobby where the player got their first Neuromod. The keycard to the skill recording room allows the player to go through this window and up a flight of stairs to the second floor, if they haven't repaired the grav shafts, that is. From here, the volunteer testing area, the player can open and exit to the second floor, leading out onto the balcony, wrapping around the floor below, which also leads to entrances to the volunteer quarters and neuromod fabrication. The position of all these rooms as spokes around the hub of the lobby position the lobby in the center of this configuration. Similar shapes are seen in crew quarters and the command bridge. And, as it turns out, shuttle bay. As mentioned, the whole level is made to wrap around the docked shuttle, creating a pseudo-circular layout. Where Shuttle Bay doesn't commit though is the areas from the far side of the entrance, the areas I found to be sparse and lacking. Because the areas are so open and formless, it makes the level feel lopsided, with all of the cool stuff on the side of the entrance. I understand not wanting to put a lot of structure around the big opening where spacecraft are supposed to enter and exit the station, but at the very least, putting a couple of offices or enclosures in the far corners here might have given that section a bit more purpose, and propped up some of the map's shortcomings. 
So, last minute addition here, I noticed that I just contradicted myself. I just said that Shuttle Bay is like levels with paths that lead between multiple entrances and exits, but I also said it's like hub levels with only one. Clearly Shuttle Bay has more than one entry or exit, and if I'm trying to set these two types of levels up as mutually exclusive groups, it doesn't help my argument if I'm indecisive about which one this area is. On reflection, I think the taxonomy I'm trying to set up is more porous than I initially thought. Another counterexample in the game is the Arboretum. It has exits to guts, crew quarters, deep storage, and the exterior of the ship, but still manages to have a very obvious geometric center in Alex's office. The shuttle in Shuttle Bay is obviously the landmark that's trying to be that center, but with that docking area having an exit only on one side, circular movement around the perimeter of the map is interrupted if you're going in a particular direction. The emptiness on this side of the map also means a lack of geometry to reinforce the shuttle as its center, the way the carpet from the lobby entrance points right to it. I think my inability to classify Shuttle Bay into one group or the other speaks to the form of the map being unclear. I'm also open to the notion that this method of grouping levels in the game could, in fact, be complete horseshit. Just because I'm working in the field doesn't mean that I can't be completely wrong, and I think it's only healthy to call oneself on it. Anyways, back to the video. So, third, if your level has only one entry or exit, make it a hub and create a number of spokes around the perimeter. The entry should ideally lead right into the central point so the player knows where to go back to. In the absence of a specific directed path, then, the player is most likely going to go around the perimeter from spoke to spoke in a circular path, in order to loot these areas one by one. So, uh, don't place anything there that would fuck with that. Next, let's talk about the rooms between these paths. A number of them are just open for players to enter and loot items, giving them supplies for crafting, healing, reloading weapons, getting upgrades, and restoring psi and armor. These rooms are off the main paths, obviously, but it's interesting to note that a number of them are dead ends, like the bathrooms to the right of the entrance in Shuttle Bay. A number of these side rooms, though, offer secret paths if the player has either the right skill to remove a blockage, or if they're just observant enough. The more obvious example is that tape drive to the left of Shuttle Bay's entrance that needs Leverage 3 to move, providing an alternate path to those grav shafts to the ground floor and a shorter path to the escape pod bay, but that's more of a hallway than its own room. However, that pilot's lounge that requires hacking to get into? Yeah, it turns out there's a hatch in the ceiling you can go up through and end up in the looking glass display above the sky lounge next to the main lobby. So, theoretically, the player could go the opposite way if they're observant enough and circumvent the need to hack to get into that room in the first place. If we draw a direct line between these entrances, though, we can see it runs in a complementary direction as the hallway's wrapping around it. If we were to move the doors to these rooms to point the path in the opposite direction, it kind of looks weird, right? Like the exit would be encouraging the player to move to the escape pod bay, even though it's a side quest. It's putting emphasis on going towards the wrong thing in the layout. Another good example of this is hardware labs. When first going through, the player needs to get from the central area to the labs in the back where the airlock is. The main path requires the player to plug up this electrical junction, but it also leaves them in a pretty exposed area to enemies in the next room. If the player goes to the left, however, there's a passage blocked by some crates. Using the myriad ways of unblocking it lets the player have an alternative path into the workshop on the ground floor. And, if the player uses the grav shafts to go up on the second floor, they can open a hatch in the back of this medical room which leads them onto a duct in the workshop as well. Both of these alternate paths run parallel to the main route, making sure that if the player uses them, they're still moving in the intended direction. Looking at the Neuromod Division's layout, there's a number of secret paths as well. There's one connecting between this hatch in the balcony to over the balcony and over the top of the volunteer quarters and another connecting the volunteer quarters to the top floor of the fabrication area, as well as a couple of smaller ones within these areas. Incorporating these connections then, shows that the second floor actually wraps around the lobby below like a ring, further emphasizing the circular nature of the area. Because the path in hub-like levels is ostensibly a circle going around the perimeter, secret passages in these areas are used to reinforce that. So, fourth, create secret passages through the level only if they emphasize a main path. 
For areas with more than one exit, have these areas run parallel to the main path they're closest to, to keep the player moving towards the destination points along these routes. For areas that are more of just a hub, have secret paths that connect the spokes that branch off that to reinforce the hub as the geometric focus. Some rooms, however, don't really have any connections to other areas. I know if you get really reductive, it's kind of obvious. Either rooms are interconnected or they're not. But looking closer, some of them are very deliberately that way. In Shuttle Bay, the areas that are best categorized as isolated are the tooling room, the control tower deck, the office, and the escape pod bay. The isolation of the escape pod bay kind of makes sense since it's a side objective, but two of the other areas, the tooling room and the control tower, are places with objectives that the player needs to get to for the main quest, by turning the grav shafts back on and extending the walkway to the shuttle, respectively. If these objectives were just lying out in the middle of the level's main paths, which are meant to be pretty wide and obvious, then the player would just need to run past and pick them up, not really taking the environment in. Because these rooms, or spokes, are isolated from the rest of the layout, it both provides a very specific choke point or length of a path that the player is much more likely to go through letting the designer anticipate the player's path a little bit more, and prompts the player to move off the main walkways through the environment, making these objectives feel like something the player needs to go out of their way to accomplish. So, fifth, create rooms that only have one entry or exit to place objectives in. Doing this allows the designer to make the player slow down and get around a blocker or search the area for a particular keycard, instead of just focusing on combat and traversal. Placing objectives in isolated rooms also ensures the player can't just run through the area, and reduces the chance of them accidentally stumbling into it and not understanding what they just ran into or picked up. Next, we have to talk about the player's movement. Obviously, if you want to make sure the player can't get somewhere, the easiest thing is to build a room around a location and just block it off with a locked door. In terms of player containment though, that can get pretty repetitive really quickly, and it blocks off a lot of area from being visible, which might not be appropriate in certain situations. Of course, you can also block off certain areas with physics objects like tape drives and crates, but as has been mentioned multiple times, there's many ways around that, so it's not necessarily something that will prompt the player to search for a way around it. The players also got a number of tools at their disposal, including the jetpack, the glue gun, and the ability to mantle, that makes keeping things out of the reach of the player nigh impossible. A lot of levels are built with tons of verticality in order to accommodate this, which gives players a jungle gym-like environment to have fun climbing around. This runs the risk, though, of having players just circumvent all the obstacles by climbing over everything. In order to more organically restrict the player, we have to understand what the player's movement tools can't do. First, as mentioned in part 1, glue can't stick to glass, which is a good start, but placing giant glass panes willy-nilly in the middle of maps where needed is probably not going to look very sensical. This is where mantling and the jetpack come in, though. Mantling requires a ledge with a vacant space on top, while the propulsion system only slows the player descent when active. Because of this, both abilities are unable to deal with obstacles that are either taller than the player's height plus their position at their jump's apex, but spraying glue on a wall provides a mantle point to get around that. The solution? Overhangs. Because there's no space for the player to mantle, and the propulsion system can't help players ascend, having a balcony stick out is an effective way to prevent players from just climbing up anywhere they want to get to. Shuttle Bay uses this for the control center itself, and surrounds it with a lot of glass panes, really trying to isolate it. The player is still able to climb up there by using glue on the steel support beams, but that's pretty difficult due to finicky placement and the amount of ammo that that would use up. So the chance that the player is going to use this strategy is pretty unlikely. If you want the player to see something ahead of time though, but don't want them to break through glass for a shortcut, Prey has a couple of tools for this. First, there's several types of windows with metal bars on them, which allows the player to shatter the glass and even shoot through it, but not pass through. At least at their normal size. If you also don't want players to be able to shoot at something, then there's this bulletproof variation that looks like a perpetual kerosene fire. So, sixth, contain the player organically through the use of the game's systems via glass and overhangs. It's worth noting the obvious that containment for mantling and glue gun usage is dependent on normal gravity, so they don't apply in levels with microgravity. Because of this, areas like Guts and Talos 1's exterior either restrict the player to a long, linear path, 
or don't really have much in the way of containment. Unfortunately, this ends up making spacewalk levels not much more than a point A to point B affair, so don't get too complicated with objectives if that's the kind of environment you want to make. Back to that steel beam and shuttle bay the player can climb up using glue. Because of this one exception, something else worth bringing up is that the player is capable of getting pretty much everywhere. Objectives that require things to be done in a specific order, then, aren't the most compatible with the kind of levels Prey is striving for, because sequence breaking is apt to happen. Either sub-goals building towards main goals need to only be implicit or understood as being circumventable. In Shuttle Bay, this comes in the form of reactivating the grav shafts in order to get up to the control tower. And reactivating grav shafts comes with its own implied sub-goal of accessing the tooling room in order to do it from there. Though this path is implied as being necessary, the player can get around this by climbing up that steel beam we mentioned, or climbing along these ducts and reactivating the shafts in this maintenance area, or by climbing up from that panel and taking a secret path up to the top floor. This also comes into play with some extremely elevated areas. Places like Deep Storage and this reactor midway through Guts have some pipes and vents really far off the ground, but still manage to have some items placed up there, or even an entirely new path around an obstacle, in order to indicate to the player, yeah, we figured you'd get up here. Even when packing three, four, or five different levels to push verticality to an impressive degree, Arcane is aware that elevation isn't really meaningful unless the player can actually get there. This idea of if you can see it, you can go there, however, also in a way seems to be a goal for the game. Seeing hardware labs explode and then floating through the wreckage during the very next mission sets up a pretty significant precedent, that nothing the player sees is off limits. There's no dramatic story cutscene that happens to occur in some room you conveniently can't get to, because the idea of a weird stage where the plot happens at you makes the world feel phony and artificial. But a stage that you can climb onto after the fact keeps everything grounded, and lets the player know the events that they just watched happened in relation to the position they were just in. So, seventh, build maps so that the player can reach anywhere within them and assume that they will. Immersive sims are all about finding ways objects in the world can interact with each other so that the player can see the impact they can have on the environment around them. A basis of that, though, is having an environment the player feels they can have an impact on. If a lot of plot moments happen in gated areas that are restricted to the player, or if they make their way to an out-of-the-way area only to find it sparse, it's going to feel like the environment is artificially restricted, limiting how the player can act on it. Uh, you know those dioramas you had to make as, like, school projects in fifth grade? Yeah, don't do that here. This next one may be a bit roundabout, but it has to do with the number of enemies. So, there's a number of items placed in the level for the player to pick up that are static, or the same, every time the player plays through the game. Now, I'm not a guy who spends a lot of time in spreadsheets trying to balance things, because, you know, that sounds like hell. Uh, but I would assume that these hand-placed items are arranged to give a small bit of ammo for all possible playstyles. In contrast to this are random drops, most notably from enemies and corpses, though I assume the loot tables are constructed with a similar distribution in mind. I'm also assuming that there's no trickery in the code to cater random drops towards weapons and abilities the player has been using more heavily, and truthfully, the player being able to fabricate whatever ammo types they want really throws a wrench in the machinery. The impact of this, then, is that a player whose playstyle incorporates a broad number of weapons that use many different ammo types is going to be more advantaged than a player who uses only a couple, because they can use a small amount of more resources to deal damage and receive small amounts of those resources back to replenish reserves. If a player drains all their pistol rounds on an enemy, they might get a couple of bullets back from a drop, but will still be ultimately behind where they started. Man, it's almost like a strategy focusing on only two or three weapons is really frustrating or something. Because of this, enemies should be strong enough in order to withstand a fair number of rounds, in order to make the resource cost of killing them feel very significant and, hopefully, push players towards using more and more weapons and abilities. Damage dealt by enemies also scales as a result, which means the fewer enemies the player can effectively deal with. Also, making the enemy stronger makes them feel more individually intimidating, 
which suits the survival horror tone the game tries to hit but gives up on, and maybe I should have just said that instead of writing a whole page trying to pull loot drops into this. So, eighth, plan encounters in your levels around fewer enemies and tweak accordingly. Some good examples include a fight where the player needs to go into the water purification plant in Talos 1, and when the player first exits into the lobby from the Arboretum. In both cases, the only enemy there is a single Technopath, though there's a couple of phantoms in the water plant, but they're far enough away that they likely won't get alerted. Don't be afraid to start with one principal enemy, and then scale up if you really feel it's necessary. Lastly, I want to pick up a thread I kinda dropped when talking about the intro level. Progression in Prey includes unlocking upgrades via the skill tree, and while a number of them are passive, like increased inventory space or resistance to electric damage, a great deal of them unlock new abilities, making them active skills. Because of the structure of Prey, using Stim in response, almost all of these active abilities correspond to stimuli that are present in the game, allowing the player to use them at their disposal. However, as discussed before, there's a certain number of tools and abilities that all players have access to without the use of neuromods. Because of this, certain obstacles can't be, or are at least way more difficult to, circumvent in the earlier portions of the game. Obstacles that require Leverage 3, for instance, can be gotten rid of using Recycler Mines, but the player typically doesn't get access to those until Psychotronics, the second place the player heads to after reaching the lobby. As per the example of how I would improve the training level, heavy objects can also be moved with explosions that have enough force, but as the game shipped, that's kind of left up to the player to discover on their own. As such, anything that requires leverage 2 or 3 to move is probably going to be a pretty effective form of player containment earlier on, but less so as the player progresses. So let's make a list of all the stims the player can use and separate them into groups. One for stims that all players have access to, and another for ones that need to be unlocked. For starters, all the weapons in the game, as Prey doesn't restrict the ability to wield them behind skill unlocks. This includes a hit stim from the wrench, glue as a stim, bullet stims from the pistol and shotgun, an electric stim from the disruptor gun, Q-beam as a stim, and a sound stim from the dart gun. On top of this are the grenades, which is another source of electric stimuli, a recycler stim, a lure stim for Typhon, and a null wave stim. On top of that are environmental hazards that the player can control indirectly. Those pipes of fire, for instance, need to be punctured with a bullet or an explosion. Same goes for these less frequent pipes full of uh, acid, I guess. And speaking of explosions, those pressurized canisters can be moved to particular areas and punctured to provide an explosive, or physics stim. The fire and physics stims can be controlled directly by the player later on though, after they purchase the kinetic blast or pyrokinesis skills. Psychoshock also provides another way of creating null wave stims, and leverage can enable the player to impart greater physics forces. But other than that, upgrades provide access to stims that weren't available prior, including hacking, repairing, morphing, mind jack, and remote manipulation. Because of this, you can create obstacles around a stim or multiple stims and categorize them into early, mid, and late game obstacles. Though that's a bit fudged by the varying levels of leverage, hacking, and repair, as well as the more powerful weapons like the Q-beam, though I don't think there's any obstacles centered around that weapon. When creating spaces for mid and late game players though, there's no guarantee that they'll have any one particular ability to get around these blockages. You then also have weird edge cases like the player purposefully not purchasing any upgrades as Joseph Anderson mentioned doing in his own video on this game. What he also mentioned is finding that all objectives had a way of being accomplished with just the wrench, glue gun, pistol, jetpack, and particular keycards, which is our solution around this problem. Though the jetpack and keycards aren't exactly stims, the rest of these are included in our any player can access these list. So lastly, ninth, make sure all objectives have a path that can be cleared by any player. As much as I love System Shock 2, there's one point in the hydroponics level where the player's given some upgrade points and told to go spend them on the research skill, which they need to complete the level. This sucks because if the player wanted to play a character that isn't a researcher, then they don't really have a choice. 
Prey can provide multiple paths to any objective catering to multiple skill levels or preferences, but at least one needs to be completable by any player build. This any player path doesn't need to be the most visible, low risk, or even easiest out of all of them, but it should be there to support as many playstyles as possible. Actually, I lied. There's a tenth and final principle that we need to cover. That's my favorite. Uh. You know, it's funny because it's also one in general at Bethesda with Bethesda games, and we have the same. We have exactly the same. The subtitle says, You just fall to your death anyway. Since Prey's come out, a lot has been made of the fate of the immersive sim genre. Prey didn't exactly do too great, and with Arcane's previous title, Dishonored 2, released a few months prior, also falling short of possibly unreasonable expectations, this weird meme of the death of single-player games started going around. More specifically, however, a couple of people have written that this might signal another death of immersive sims, the way there was one between Deus Ex and, well, Deus Ex, the Bioshocks notwithstanding. Prey is probably the best version of the prototypical immersive sim that's been made so far, with dense, interconnected systems and other characters in the game being shown to use the same abilities the player has, leading to a bunch of mini-narrative moments. Hell, every corpse in the game is a named crew member with their own story as to how they died. That is an insane amount of work to put into a game's narrative. Unfortunately for newcomers to the genre, being confronted with that density and, as I argued in part 1, not given a very digestible intro into the game, I'm not surprised not a lot of people were into what Prey was offering. Because, and to be fair, games that aren't considered immersive sims have proven themselves as more effective entryways to them. Breath of the Wild was kind of the biggest game on the planet for a few months, and though I've made fun of its borderline plagiarism in the past, if Nintendo ripping off these ideas gets even a few more people to purchase Dishonored, I'm totally cool with it. Similarly, a number of video essay boys I've talked to have mentioned a fascination with Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, and have described it as being an immersive sim. As Raphael Colantonio, the project director on Prey, said, the best fate immersive simulations can have as a genre is to have their ideas become so pervasive that the label becomes meaningless. And hey, things aren't all bad for Prey. Between this video and the last, the Mooncrash DLC was released, which was very well received. Hell, I played it and I really enjoyed it. While Prey could be characterized as the best version of a safe bet, Mooncrash was anything but cautious. Structuring itself around characters with different neuromod trees, the player has to manage all of them while managing a consistent economy of resources between them, which, uh... Oh boy, you thought things were complicated before. However brief it was, this seemed to give Prey a bit of a second wind in the press, and I'm really anticipating the Typhon Hunter release. Which just released. The fact that it took Mooncrash's release to communicate the promise of the base game, though, is kind of a tragedy. I started this script on the game like... Ten. Months ago? Oi, vey. Uh, kind of ambivalent on Prey. But over the course of working on these videos, I've been convinced, no, this is an amazing game, and I'm just sad that more people haven't found it accessible enough. If you tried Prey and found yourself bouncing off of it, maybe give it another try, and if you've been eyeing the game, but with trepidation, maybe pick it up on sale, because while it's one of the games I've spent the most effort into trying to love, there was something there for me to love. Also, let's take a break from Immersive Sims for the next video, okay? My name is Morgan. You don't tell me what to do. I'm on a station in space and it's called Talos. I see mimics surrounding, making my space confounding. I see phantoms, a menace, harassing my pal Dennis. He's got no business being up in this, but here we are. So I guess it's time for me to go a little bit hard. Now that I'm gone and done a shout out, sit right there and let me tell you all about- Hey, Jared, go what's up? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> okay. Do you want to do that one more time? Yes. <laughs> Without cracking it.
Bunch of little things called innocent systems put in the game to keep you from quitting them. They're all about options for creativity to get you at the confines of your own proclivities. Drop you into a structured game world. All sorts of toys giving you license to twirl. You see those enemies way over there. Cover them in blue. Maybe use psionics too. Who cares if it really ain't fair? The Euro tools circle one and do what you dare.